So welcome everyone. Um, my name is Rob Doe, Director of Multicultural Affairs here at Bristol Community College. And I wanna thank you for joining us today to add our next part of our social justice forum, which is also part of our Martin Luther King Jr. Week of Celebration. Um, today's presentation is 603 Days Later, Where Are We Now? Um, since, the, in, since the beginning of our social justice forums that began back um, 603 days ago already, um, after the despicable gross crime that we witnessed of George Floyd uh, murder uh, in Minneapolis, um, we saw a huge influx of people and, and, and allies come out that were really, really behind the, um, you know, looking at really behind us, looking to how do we solve this issue and how do we come together as, as a community. During that time, um, we saw protests really take the streets, um, not just in Minneapolis, but all throughout the United States and even outside of the United States in places like London um, and, and beyond. As that was happening, we saw, we, we received many, many emails and a lot of individuals who were extremely really gung-ho and, and, and wanted to say, how can I help and be part of the solution? Since that time, we've had several um, social justice forums where we, we spoke about many different topics and all the different intersectionalities of race, orientation, um, abilities that, we, uh, that were part of these forums. Our first forum was extremely powerful and passionate. And it happened the Thursday right after um, the George Floyd incident. And during that forum, we had over 250 people join us for that call. And while they joined us in that call, people were heartbroken. They were, they felt it. You can feel the tension and the energy. We were on that call that was supposed to be for an hour and a half. It lasted four hours. That's how powerful it was. But since then, it died down. Our numbers started to shrink. Individuals were coming to these forums after having this motivation of, of pride or, or, or allyship um, or guilt, wherever it may have been of why individuals join um, these forums. And as that happened, we started seeing less and less activity and less and less of people paying attention. Now, this world is, there's been some difficult times with COVID and, and, and a lot of mental health issues and pressures, so we get it. But we don't wanna forget about where we were 603 days ago and what, and what we all determined, most of us determined that we would start doing at our schools, in our homes, for our communities. Um, today, many of you guys that are part of this call is like preaching to the choir. We understand that the individuals here care they want to learn and want to better themselves as we move forward. But we wanna make sure that this message continues. So our next part of our social justice, um, our, our social justice forums as we move forward is being comfortable with uncomfortable conversations. And we have to have those things in order to move forward. So today is really gonna spark this as this is a national day of healing, which started back in 2017. Our national day of racial healing um, is an annual, it's, it, it's dedicated to the healing of many, many things that we've seen throughout. We understand that it was launched in 2017, in January of 17 or 2017, as an opportunity to bring people together in their community, uh, common humanity to take collective action to create more just and equitable world. This day is part of our celebration week of MLK Celebration Week, which will really bring us together to find solutions and opportunities to come together as a community. Today, we bring to you um, our special guest who was here last year uh, during, who was here last year during our MLK keynote, and he did a fantastic job. So I wanted to bring him back as, as we will probably partner with him many, many more times in the future, but what a better way to connect to where, um, to the work that we're doing now um, by having him launch um, some of this work. And that's Dr. David E. Jones. And Dr. David E. Jones is the Chief 
diversity officer at William Patterson University. He is a leading voice for diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, and highly respected diversity consultant, speaker, um, executive, um, and community leader. He is a member of the Black Speakers Network, a um, teaching faculty member for equity, for the Equity Institute at the University of Southern California Race and Equity Center. And he's a co-director and co-founder for the National Association for Student Personnel Administrators. As a recipient of numerous regional and national awards, Dr. Jones has been recognized as a national association uh, by, the, by the National Association for Student Personnel uh, Administrators with the Doris Ching Award for Excellence as a Student Affairs Professional. He has been featured on media outlets such as the Big Ten Network, Higher, Higher Ed Live Network Students Affairs Live Show, and Inclusion in Progress Podcast. So as we begin this, this journey today, I'd like to Welcome to you, um, Dr. David E. Jones, and welcome, my friend. Thank you, Rob, and uh, thank you, Melissa, for, for having me. I'm delighted to spend uh, this time with all of you, and I want to thank you all for being here. Your presence, um, one, uh, demonstrates your commitment to this work that is happening at Bristol Community College. And so we're here today to be in a space of healing, um, to be in a space where we can gather as a community to work through our understanding, our challenges, and our experiences around race. And so what is, is my hope today as your facilitator is to really create the space for you to dive deep into this topic and to be um, in a space where you can feel as if your authentic self is centered in this conversation. So thank you again, Rob. Thank you, uh, Melissa, for, for having me. It is truly um, a, a, a honor to be able to come back to the campus in this capacity and, and help you all as you move forward in this work. Um, we have spent the last two years in moments of isolation, moments of silence, moments of confusion. And so here we are today to really grapple with what that all means and what that all looks like and how we can move forward together in this work. So let me just go ahead and share my screen to get us started. 603 days later, engaging change agents in productive racial justice practices. And I see you all as change agents because you're here, you're committed, and you're a part of this work as we move forward. I wanna first provide a land acknowledgement to center us on, on where we are and, and what land we are occupying um, currently. And so I wanna acknowledge and recognize the, the traditional land of the Wampanoag people as a traditional land on which you all at Bristol Community College occupy. And also the traditional land of the Lenape people past and present where I currently sit and occupy in West Orange, New Jersey. We give honor to the Lenape people and the Wampanoag people as the indigenous stewards of this land and the original inhabitants of this traditional land. In that, we express our gratitude and pay respect and honor for the original caretakers of this land. So let's take a moment for that. Okay. I wanna frame our time together with a quote, a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as we celebrated his holiday yesterday and the remarkable civil rights activist and icon that he was and how we continue to carry out his life and legacy to this day. I wanna start with a quote that's going to push us to think about our role in this work, right? And how we sometimes might remain complicit to the work and how we um, don't push the agenda forward. Oftentimes the quotes that we see from Dr. King um, you know, don't necessarily speak to really the, the what would be framed as the radical and raw work of racial justice and equity that he was centered and committed on. And so I share and read this quote to you to ground our time together. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor 
or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate, who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with you with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by a mythical concept of time and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. I don't know about you, but for me, this quote is more relevant today than probably ever before. And it shows up in organizations, it shows up on college campuses where folks sign up to do this work, like all of you. But then they place racial equity detours or they place certain language and buzzwords that speak to the discomfort of actually doing the work, right? Naming it as an inconvenient time to do it and placing it as a, an agenda item later on, right? Um, we can't do that when it comes to racial justice work. If we're going to heal from the racial justice and pain and harm that many of us might have endured or many of us might have um, been complicit to, then we need to be ready to move the agenda forward in a very direct and meaningful way um, that doesn't bring us back, but also, but more importantly, takes us forward. So I'm framing our time together with that particular excerpt. And we are gonna get into some breakout groups to have some more in, intimate conversations around these, this topic in particular. Before doing so, I want to provide you with racial justice discussion agreements that we can all commit to in this work as we have these honest, raw, and authentic conversations. One is that we agree to make this a brave space, a space where people can be brave enough to share their experiences around race and, and work through whatever healing that they need to do in this particular moment. That we will make I statements and not you statements, right? So we will speak from our own lived experience and what that looks like that we will recognize the difference between intent versus impact, right? I want you to think about the impact as you're going through your intention, okay? Uh, because oftentimes we have the best intentions of the world, but we don't think about how it's being received by others. And often those that impact can be harmful, can be triggering, and can produce um, moments of, 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 of fear and uncertainty. Know when to take space and make space. And so, like I said, we'll have these small breakout groups. We won't have a lot of time, right? But we'll have enough time to begin a conversation that I encourage you to then follow up with your partners and have a larger conversation at another time. But sharing the space so that everyone can get a chance to be part of the conversation. Recognizing that what's said here stays here. Right? What's learned here leaves here. And so content-wise, take it with you. Share it with the masses across Bristol Community College. But if someone is sharing a personal story in your breakout group or in the larger group conversation that we have following the breakout group, let's keep that within this space. Let's honor this space as a safe and brave space for people to share and be their vulnerable self in a way that allows them to, to, to be authentic. Um, I wanna also remind you as, as Rob alluded to is that we won't um, be recording these conversations that I'm speaking to. And so there will be opportunity for you to have these conversations in, in, in an unrecorded space. Be present and engage. Your participation in this moment is key. We won't get this time back and it will go by fast. And so whatever distractions or other agenda items you might have um, at, 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 on, your, on your plate, let's put those to the side for the moment so that you can really dive into the content and the learning experience that you're part of. Now, Rob talked about the importance of being uncomfortable with the with being uncomfortable, uh, being comfortable with the uncomfortable rather. And so I'm encouraging you to lean into that discomfort and lean into it in a way that allows you to really take the conversation where 
your leaders here at, at Bristol Community College are looking for you to go so that we can move the social justice and racial equity agenda forward as an institution, as a community. Um, be willing to make and own and learn from your mistakes in these conversations. We're all bound to make mistakes and we're all bound to grow and heal together. And so as we're going through these experiences, um, be open to that and be receptive to the mistakes that you may make. And, and let's make sure that in those spaces, that this is a judgment-free uh, zone for, for those mistakes to occur. Understand your individual and collective role during this learning experience, right? Um, this is a learning moment, a learning opportunity, and you will take away individual uh, reactions and experiences and in collective group experiences and reactions. And so um, understand those distinct differences and how you can add value to, to, to the overall experience by bringing both space, both into the space. Is there anything else that folks need to be able to be their authentic and most vulnerable self in these discussions that we will have momentarily? If so, I encourage you to place them in the chat um, so that we can, we can make sure that these spaces are as comfortable for you to have these uncomfortable and difficult conversations. And I'm happy to revisit them at any time so that we can um, be able to ensure that authenticity is met here in this space. And so to, to position us for, for these discussions, I'm going to um, reshare my screen with a video that brings us back to those two years ago, to the painful moments of the horrific murder of George Floyd, followed by a summer of 2020, where people found their voice, exercised their voice, and were seeking justice and pain uh, and opportunity and resources. And so I want to bring you back to that moment with this video to really center us into why we are here today and, and, and thinking, uh, helping us think about what we need to do going forward. So bear with me for a moment while I share this video with you. Black house, black house, black house, black house, yeah. Everything black, church, black church, everything. Everything black, love, black love, everything. Yeah. What are you listening to? Yeah. Flowers, white is your kid, black roses. Everything black, church, black love. My grandma said it was her grandma's favorite. Skin the wall, friends the wall, here you are, black. Everything you need, better believe you are that. Skin the wall, friends the wall, here you are, black. Everything you need, better believe you are. <sighs> Freedom of summer. Peace, child. I am your ancestor. Yo. Our time has come and gone now. And though you may not know of us, know that we loved you in advance. We anticipated your brilliance and broke what chains that we could to build the world that you deserve. Tell me, do they teach us freedom summer in the year 2020? Brianna? Titi, we lost so many that summer. So much strange fruit. The pandemic of COVID-19 and police brutality. Something broke open in us. I don't have any words. Our people, we, we rose up everywhere. Every city, every night, we fought for you for your freedom. I'll never forget those nights, those streets. 26 million strong. 26 million strong. The empire trembled and suddenly there were cracks. Confederate flags banned. Public safety reimagined. Indian cops out of school. 
schools. Workers striking in defense of black lives. We will say her name. The WNBA, then the NBA, game after game canceled. Dangerous electeds voted out of office. We tore down the statues of our oppressors. Our people began to dream and fight for a world without policing, a world free of the brutal grind of capitalism. I am! I am! Somebody! Somebody! And I deserve! And I deserve! We carried our people to office. With our fists in the air. Other cities started passing reparations bills. We wrote our own laws. And you, you are our wildest, freest dreams. We flooded the streets for you, for your health. For your wealth. We spoke liberation into being, into law, into land. Child, if our work is not done, if you do not awaken every morning into black power and black love, then you must make your liberation whole. We are with you, and we know that you will win. Remember how we fought for you in the summer of 2020 and take back You, you, you are our mandate. We have a mandate. We have a mandate. And damn it, we gonna do it. Call and response. Call and response. Call and response. Call and response. The mandate for black people at this time. The mandate for black people at this time. As I transitioned from that video, I recognized the um, the chills that that video still brings me, and I've watched it several times. Um, and uh, the reminders that the video and the images bring me. And so I want you all just to take a deep breath where you are, to center yourself in this moment as we continue to move along in this workshop and this conversation, recognizing that while folks stood in the streets and spoke for justice and equity and inclusion, you know, we still, we're still fighting. We're still fighting for some of the same rights that Dr. King was fighting for in the 1950s and 60s. Voting rights are at risk right now. Voting rights are being taken away by black and brown people in various parts of this country the same voting rights that Dr. King was fighting for. And so you look at this video, you ask yourself, how far have we come? And you think about how far we must continue to go to truly realize the dream that he had for this country, that he had for people across all racial ethnic backgrounds. And sure, we need this time to heal we need this time to process and digest what we've all been through and experienced. But this time also has to be a period of action, a period of uniformity across difference so we can really, really move the needle toward justice and bend that, that arc toward justice as Dr. King so eloquently said. I will also say that there might have been images in the video that were perhaps triggering or hurtful. And so I do turn to Melissa and Rob, you know, as resources to all of you that were part of this experience, that if you need um, conversation, dialogue, or support, 
and resources beyond today that the two of them could certainly be there as a, as a layer of support at the institution. And I am also readily available to process anything with anyone that participated in today's workshop, as you will have my contact information at the end. Um, so please feel free to reach out to me at any point if, if you would like to continue the conversation or process anything that you experience this, this afternoon. So let me go ahead and reshare my screen to bring us back into um, Okay, so at this time, we're going to enter our initial stages of conversation. Um, and before we do that, I'm going to launch a poll to really assess where we are as a community. This poll is an anonymous poll. So it, the, what you put in as your result will not go back as, as you as the respondent. Um, but we are interested to truly understand your comfortability at having these conversations, right? Because we can all say that we're, we're, we're down for the cause to eradicate racism, but then how are we, are we really truly ready for the conversation that needs to be had? And so I'm going to launch this poll and invite you all to provide your responses to the prompt, which is, I am comfortable having difficult yet necessary conversations about race and racism. Uh, you can either strongly agree, you can agree somewhat, you can say I am unsure, you can disagree somewhat, and you can strongly disagree. So take a moment as I launch this poll to respond to this particular prompt. Okay, it looks like we have 100% um, participation, which is great. So thank you all for participating. I'm going to end the poll and share it with you all. Okay, so you should be able to see the results as we talk through them. Um, <clears throat> so out of all the participants, right, nine out of 15 uh, either strongly agree or agree somewhat that they are comfortable having uh, conversations about race and racism, right? But we do have um, a contingency of folks, which I want to embrace and welcome into this space, uh, six out of 15 who are unsure and uh, disagree that they are comfortable having conversations about race and racism. And so as we begin to go into our breakout groups and have a conversation around a particular prompt that I'm going to give you, um, I want you to understand where we all are, right? We're at various parts of the continuum as it relates to these type of conversations. And so let's embrace everybody and meet our peers where they are in their own learning and development so that we can have the most effective conversation possible. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is invite you to um, have conversations about your early race moments, okay? I want you to describe your first moment with race or racism. You know, think back to what was that first moment? Was it your childhood? Was it high school? Was it yesterday? What was that first moment that you had in your life Will you either recognize your own race or recognize the race of someone who was different than you? And what, what was that moment? Describe it to your partner briefly. Um, was, that a, was it a positive moment? Was it a neutral moment? Was it a negative moment, right? Talk about that with your partners. Um, as it relates to thinking about race that's different than your own race, okay? And then talk about how and whom, by whom were these ideas and beliefs transmitted? So where did you receive these messages? Or where did you have this experience? Was it in the home? Was it at school? Was it your, your first coach? Was it within your spiritual affiliated space of worship, right? Was it in your community? You know, where was it? 
right? Um, and how did, how did those ideas and beliefs get transmitted? And then over time, how has this thinking informed your thinking of others of a different race? Um, how, how has that impacted you? Okay. So um, I invite you to take a screenshot, take a picture of the prompts um, before we go into our breakout groups um, because um, you won't necessarily have them with you um, as, as we move forward. So I'll give you just a, a moment to do, do what you need to do to either take a picture or take a screenshot of, of these questions so that you have them going into your breakout group. We're also going to uh, text it into the chat as well. Okay, perfect, perfect. So as they're doing that, I'm going to set up the breakout groups and we will make these small enough so that you can have some really good conversation. Rob and Melissa, will you be joining these groups or, or will you be staying out of these groups? I'm just curious. No, no pressure. Just, just we can join. Absolutely. Okay. I can join. Okay. So, um, okay. So it should, it should show up where there's at least between three and four people in a group. Um, All right. So yeah, between three and four people in a group. Um, are we are we all set to make that transition? Okay, perfect. Um, I'm going to give you. Uh, I would love to give you a lot of time, but I recognize the, the the space that we're in in terms of the time that we have. I'm going to give you 17 minutes, right? About two minutes to get yourself situated, and then 15 minutes for the for the content conversation, um, and then we will come back and have roughly about 10 minutes as a larger group to to really. Um, process what you all what you all discussed in your smaller groups okay um and once again the, these conversations will not be recorded and so we will, we will end the re pause the recording to to have these conversations any questions before we go into the breakout groups okay. hearing no questions i'm going to go ahead and open up the room so you will receive a notification to join the room um and so please feel free to join it once you receive that notification and enjoy be be responsive to racial injustice and breaking down some of these barriers that Dr. King and so many others have been fighting for for far too long. Um, you know, we have we have a, a real role and responsibility in knowing what what those systemic barriers are and then how to to break those break down those barriers. And so, um, our final segment of our time today is going to talk about how do we now use our agency as, as, as social justice warriors to activate the need for change. And, and, and as we go through our own healing process, how do we then show up as those change agents so that we can um, hopefully see brighter days, right? And hopefully realize Dr. King's dream in our lifetime or maybe the next person's lifetime, but you know you did your part to help facilitate that type of change. And so I'm gonna show you a video um, at this time um, to help us articulate that in a meaningful way. So hold on one second while I make that transition. Do you all... Uh... I like your level of organization. <laughs> hey, thank you. There you go. Okay. This is Jamal. Jamal is a boy who lives in a poor neighborhood. He has a friend named Kevin who lives in a wealthy neighborhood. All of Jamal's neighbors are African American, 
and all of Kevin's neighbors are white. Because Jamal's school district is mostly funded by property taxes, his school is not very well funded. His classrooms are overcrowded, his teachers are underpaid, and he doesn't have access to high quality tutors or extracurricular activities. Kevin's school district is also funded by property taxes, so his school is very well funded. His classrooms are never crowded, his teachers are very well paid, and he has access to high quality tutors and lots of extracurricular activities. Kevin and Jamal live only a few streets away from each other. So how come they're growing up in such different worlds with such different opportunities for success? The answer has to do with America's history of systemic racism. To understand it better, let's look at what life was like for Kevin and Jamal's grandparents. Decades after the Civil War, many government agencies started to draw maps dividing cities into sections that were either desirable or undesirable for investment. This practice was called redlining, and it usually blocked off entire black neighborhoods from access to private and public investment. Banks and insurance companies used these maps for decades to deny black people loans and other services based purely on race. Historically speaking, owning a home and getting a college education is the easiest way for an American family to build wealth. But when Jamal's grandparents wanted to buy a house, the banks refused because they lived in a neighborhood that was redlined. So Jamal's grandparents were not able to buy a home, and because colleges could prevent them from attending through legal segregation, their options for higher education were really scarce. Kevin's grandparents, on the other hand, got a low-interest loan to buy their first house and got accepted into a handful of top universities, which traditionally only accepted white students. This opened up a wealth of opportunities that they were able to pass on to their kids and grandkids. Even as late as the 1980s, an investigation into the Atlanta real estate market showed that banks were more willing to lend to low-income white families than to middle or upper-income African-American families. As a result, today, for every $100 of wealth held by a white family, black families have $5.04. A 2017 study confirms that redlining is still affecting home values in major cities like Chicago today. This explains how Kevin and Jamal inherited vastly different circumstances. Unfortunately, the story doesn't end there. A big part of systemic racism is implicit bias. These are prejudices in society that people are not aware that they have. Let's go back to Kevin and Jamal. Against all odds, Jamal manages to be the only student from his high school to get accepted into a great university, the same one that Kevin and his high school friends are attending. But after Kevin and Jamal both graduate, Jamal notices that his resume isn't drawing as much interest as Kevin's, even though they graduated from the same program with the exact same GPA. Unfortunately for Jamal, studies show that resumes with white-sounding names get twice as many copies callbacks as identical resumes with black sounding names. Implicit bias is one of the reasons why the black unemployment rate is twice the rate of white unemployment, even among college graduates today. You can see evidence of systemic racism in every area of life. The disparities in family wealth, incarceration rates, political representation, and education are all examples of systemic racism. Unfortunately, the biggest challenge with systemic racism is that there's no single person or entity responsible for it, which makes it very hard to solve. So what can you do? The first thing you can do is work towards becoming more aware of your own implicit biases. What are some prejudices that you might hold that you're not aware of? Second, let's acknowledge that the consequences of slavery and Jim Crow laws are still affecting access to opportunity today. As a result, we should support systemic changes that create more equal opportunities for everyone. Increasing public school funding and making it independent from property taxes would be a great start so that poor and wealthy districts can receive equal access access to resources. Systemic problems require systemic solutions. Luckily, we're all part of the system, which means that we all have a role to play in making it better. Peace. So recognizing that, right, that we all have a role to play in, in making things better. Um, let's, let's really spend some time talking about what, what that may look like. So I'm gonna go ahead and reshare my screen. Okay. Um, so we, <clears throat> we don't have a lot of time left. So instead of doing a breakout room, we're gonna just spend the time here. We're, we're a relatively small group. Um, and we can use this space to, to engage in these prompts. 
And so what I want you to think about is thinking of the, the systemic barriers that that video illustrated, right? Thinking about the things that Dr. King fought for, right? So you have Dr. King, you know, fighting for equal and civil rights um, in the 1950s and 60s, uh, up until his assassination in 1968. Um, where a lot of his work was for racial justice, also economic justice, um, also um, poverty, right, jobs. And so he spent a lot of time thinking about various forms of justice for, for, for Americans in this country. And then you fast forward to where we are today, right? And we're reflecting on what we have accomplished and what we, where we have been since the horrific George Floyd murder right, and the rise of Black Lives Matter and its presence toward racial justice inequality. Um, as a change agent, it's really critical that you reflect on what your role is in breaking down some of these systemic barriers that the video alluded to, and also thinking about what this means in terms of your work, even within the space you occupy at Bristol Community College. Um, so I want you to think about, you know, describing how you have productively engaged in racial justice work since the George Floyd murder. Uh, what are two or three key learnings that you have had about yourself and others since the George Floyd murder? And then since the George Floyd murder, what continues to be learning edges for you? Meaning what are areas of race and racial justice that you want to grow and learn more about and develop? Um, those, are, those are questions that I want you to think about um, as, as we move toward this role as a change agent in, in, in our work. And, and, uh, and I think just for the benefit of you all having the intimate conversations and creating vulnerable and brave spaces for people to really engage with each other in these prompts, I am going to put you all in, in, in back in your breakout groups for just a few moments um, for, for this dialogue. Uh, we, we have some time to, 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 to do that. Um, so we can, we can stop the record and then I will um, put you all back in your breakout spaces. Uh, Donnie's done a great job of putting the questions in the chat box so you have them available to you um, if for racial healing. and provide space for racial healing and be in alignment with the Office of Multicultural Affairs and the work that Melissa and Robert do that looks like for you. Um, we would typically have a, 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 a large group discussion, but because we're, we're, we're running up against time, I want to be able to close out my time with you um, by providing you with some required practices for racial justice. What I am urging each and every one of you to do to engage in as you move forward. One is to raise your consciousness around race and other identities as well, but most importantly around race as we're centering this conversation and the work that's ahead for the college. Practice empathy, right? Um, practice empathy, not sympathy. I don't want you to feel bad for people. I don't want you to feel a sense of guilt, um, but I want you to be able to be open to learning and open to growing based on hearing from the experiences of others and being empathetic about that. Speak and seek your truth, right? Speak your truth, but also seek your truth as you're, as you're navigating this learning experience, very critical. Elevate the voices of those who are silenced Right, uh, many folks are silenced because of the systemic barriers that we talked about in the earlier video. And so find ways if you're at the table, if you're at a meeting, if you're at a program and you notice voices aren't included or, or identities aren't represented, find ways to elevate those voices so they can be part of the conversation. Use your privilege to help create change, whether it's your racial identity privilege or other privileges that you occupy within your identities. You can use that privilege to the advantage of creating change and moving the, the equity agenda forward. Normalize what it means to be an ally, right? We talked about that last year, if you attended the workshop I did, um, but being an ally is truly an active responsibility. Um, it requires work, it requires consistency, and it requires a sense of, of willingness to, to speak up and speak out for those who are different than you. And we need to normalize that. We need to know that let folks know that it's okay to be an ally. It's okay to speak up for something that's not right uh, to help move, move, move the needle in this work. Identify, confront, and reduce racism. I use the word reduce very intentionally. Um, you know, to eliminate racism, to charge you with the responsibility of eliminating racism, 
would be a very uh, daunting task. You know, we've been navigating dealing with racism for 400 plus years in this country. And so to um, charge you with the responsibility to eliminate racism is, is something I, I don't want to put on your shoulders. But I will put on your shoulders the responsibility to reduce racism, particularly in the spaces that you occupy and you can control. Um, affirm and validate others. Really important that people, particularly people from marginalized identities, are validated and affirmed um, as seen as human, as equal, and are given the dignity to be present and be uh, authentic in their own skin. And you need to be able to facilitate that. And then lastly, being able to hold yourself accountable, right? The importance and the need to hold yourself accountable, hold others who are part of your space accountable so that we can really, um, a year from now, see the progress and the growth that Bristol Community College is charging each and every one of you to be a part of. And so the journey, right? The racial justice journey, yours individually and collectively continues. And so I want you to reflect on the learnings that we were able to acquire today. I want you to relearn what you need to relearn to position yourself to be that change agent that's needed at Bristol Community College at this particular time to carry on that life and legacy of Dr. King and so many others. And I want you to reimagine, right, what a just society looks like, a society that where we remove the systemic barriers of inequities across various institutions that continue to persist these barriers and disenfranchise people of color and other marginalized groups. Reimagine what hope looks like. Reimagine what Dr. King's dream looks and feels like and how you can be part of that. Uh, we all have a role to play. And each and every one of you are here today because you're committed to a particular role to seeing the change that you want to see. And so I wanna thank you for allowing me to be part of this experience with you, to be part of this racial justice journey that Bristol Community College is embarking toward and continuing on to ensure that faculty, staff and students at the college receive a rich, diverse and inclusive experience within the college community. So thank you all for allowing me to be part of your experience. Thank you again to Melissa and Rob for inviting me back. And it's been my pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones, for um, today. It's it's really great to have you with us and speaking on the topic of of that matters so much to so many of us. Um, if you guys that are part of this call, please um, show your thanks, clap, throw your emojis up there, um, and gratitude from Bristol Community College and our local community for us have for us having you with us. And um, we will share this with many of our colleagues and people here. So it won't just be between the, the individuals that were on here, but it will impact so many others um, along the way. So keep doing the great work that you are doing. Um, it is important, for, it is so important. And um, we are privileged to have you again with us. Thank you again, Rob. Thank you so much. No, absolutely. As we um, close today, just to give, our individuals, you know, a heads up, um, our social justice uh, workshops um, will continue. Um, during the course of this week of L MLK Celebration Week, we are looking to bring together a series of uh, conversations and speakers. And um, today we we wrap up with Dr. Jones's. Um, yesterday we had um, Jabril, Dr. Jabril Kazan, um, who was part of the Greensboro's, Greensboro's Four. Um, and today with Dr. Jones's um, uh, workshop. And then we're this Friday, we're looking to have Dr. Ron Weisberger just talk about MLK teachings and, and how the community can develop um, that. And that'll be part of our Bristol Live events. Um, again, um, I wanna thank everyone. Please um, keep, uh, look out for our newsletter that will come out that will talk more about um, our upcoming social justice events. Um, as we will dive further into our Latino male experience and our Black male experiences, as well as uncomfortable conversations um, to be continued um, as part of our colloquium work with our academic side. So there's so much to be done. I appreciate everyone for being here, listening in, and being part of this. Um, and as we continue, if you do need us, please reach out to our Multicultural Affairs Department um, and through our social media sites 
or just email or give us a call and we will be gladly there to have a conversation or help you in any which way we can. So thank you and appreciate you all and have a great, great day. Take care, everyone. Continue to stay and be safe.